Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami The monastery I ordained at, Wat Mapjan, is located in a or near a small fishing village named Ban Pei in central Thailand, about two and a half hours east of Bangkok. And Longpur Cha sent a, another disciple there at one point to establish a monastery on the coast. And Longpur Pasano, one of my teachers who founded a Bayagiri monastery in California, went there at its inception and talked about meeting a gangster who used to run the whole uh, fishing village in terms of the black market there and the gangs. And he kept coming to this abbot of the monastery there uh, in distress about his state of his heart and his mind. And to his credit, the abbot sent him to go stay at Wapapong with Ajahn Cha. So for about two weeks, Ajahn Cha made uh, this sort of head of the entire Bonpei Mafia sleep underneath his kuti, his little hut. There's a, it's, it's on stilts, so it's not as bad as it sounds. It's easy to sleep underneath it. And uh, be his assistant, basically. So everywhere Longport Shaw went for those two weeks, this mafia don would carry his bag for him and bring him water. And after two weeks, his heart was completely changed. And he went back to Bon Pei and gathered all of his gang together and he informed them that from then on they would all be keeping the five precepts all the time and uh, and he knew very clearly actually that um, first I don't think his whole gang went along with it but he did and he knew that holding to the five precepts would mean that he would be killed um, there was no way of holding on to power in the underworld of uh, Bon Pei at the time while holding five precepts. And so over the next year and a half, he made these arrangements for his family, for his loved ones, to make sure they would be taken care of and looked after. And uh, eventually he was, and whenever one of his um, gang members did something wrong or trespassed on the precepts, he would send them to get admonished by the abbot of the local monastery. And after a year and a half, he was murdered but he lived the last year of, and a half of his life in tune with a meaning and a sense of sila, ethics, virtue, which in some sense redeemed and gave meaning to his entire life. Often when we look to our practice, we measure it by attainment, by if we've touched these states, we read about so often of the jhanas or absorption in which we've heard others speak to. And almost inevitably, our practice falls short, short of those metrics. But it's how many people enter the Dhamma in the West, and so it's held in this exalted status of we're into this whole Buddhist thing for insight, and getting our samadhi together, and no thank you, I don't have time to uh, talk, I need to go meditate in my room alone. And it's such, it makes the Buddhist path so much more narrow than it deserves to be, and which it needs to be. This Noble Eightfold Path is broad, Beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. And it encompasses and 
deals with cultivating this much wider um, spectrum of heart of the heart's qualities. And if all we're looking to is our meditation practice, we miss and neglect the qualities and the dimensions of the heart which are slowly and sometimes not so slowly growing in the background and which truly represent uh, and imbue life with meaning. So the list which the Buddha, well actually this, these aren't in the suttas, but they arise after the Buddha's time. It's a list of 10 qualities car, called the paramitas. Paramita, uh, it can mean either the perfections um, or it can mean, para means to cross and mita uh, is related to the bank. So it can also mean ways of crossing the flood of samsara. These are the rafts uh, which we use to ferry us across the stormy waters in which we're mired to the far shore. These are the crossings to the far shore. These are the perfections. And it's a list of 10 in the Theravada. In the Mahayana, they have six. But this list fills out the broader scope of a Buddhist life because it allows one to name and to bring to mind and to value. Uh, I think it was Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, who created the unit of Kelvin that says, if you want to, I think it was, if you want to change something or, or measure something, you have to name it and give it, uh, I'm summarizing, but basically give it a name and some way of measuring it or else you won't value it like it deserves to be valued. When we name things, they take on meaning. There's a, a one linguistic who, linguist who talked about there's a word for those small holes in hedges which uh, small animals burrow into and there's a name for them and as soon as he found the name for it he started seeing those little holes everywhere. So it's important to get this list um, to bring it to mind so that we can name what else is growing in our hearts so that our entire practice is not predicated on how our meditation practice is going day to day but we learn to value this broader scope of a life because although for many of us, our meditation practice is not where we wish it would be, something happens when you enter onto this path and it is a profound alchemy of the spirit and often you won't see it, but others around you will. And those quieter fruits of practice manifesting only gain the gravity they deserve when we name them and give them attention. So the perfections are dana, giving, uh, sila, virtue, nekama, renunciation, panya, wisdom, wiriya, energy, kanti, forbearance, Satcha, truth, aditana, determination, metta, loving kindness, upeka, equipoise. Does everyone remember those? I know one practitioner who went to a monastery intent on ordaining, and he couldn't at the time. Um, there uh, were duties he had back home and a son he had to look after. And coming back home, he said that those first three paramitas became almost a mantra for him every day where he turned completely towards his duty in this life of being a good father at this time. And almost like a mantra, he thought, Donna, Sila, Nekama, what can I give? How beautiful can I make my actions? What can I renounce? And these three echoing through his life, uh, in some ways this person's more monastic than a lot of monastics I know. So to not devalue these, um, it's worth bringing a few to mind. Maybe you focus a month on one of them or maybe a whole year. Um, but you can really give your attention to different ones of these paramitas. The first dana is giving. And it's the first on the list, I think, for a reason. It's true that we can cultivate all these paramitas in tandem 
but there's also a beautiful progression that can play out. Donna is so, it's the most concrete way of giving up self. You're taking what you cling to and relinquishing it. The Buddha in one sutta, I think it's Majjhima Nikaya 35, he says, bhikkhus, where there is the thought, myself, where there is a self, there's inevitably the thought, this belongs to myself. Where there is, this belongs to myself, there's inevitably the thought, myself. Our sense of unwholesome clinging self forms in the shadow of desire. And when we give up what we hold to, the sense of freedom and relinquishing of that burden of self is visceral, powerful, immediate. Giving is such an important aspect of this path and one that's often overlooked in the West. It's also in the Jataka tales of the Buddha's prior rebirths, which are probably not canonical, but it's worth noting that the, even though Donna is the first on this list, it's the last the Buddha perfects. In the last life, in the Jataka tales, that's the one, that's the perfection he brings to complete fulfillment. So this quality takes you all the way. The Buddha says that if beings knew, as I know, the fruits of giving, they would never eat without having given. Even if it was their last mouthful, they would not give with the, eat without having given if there was someone to give it to. But because beings do not know, as I know, the fruits of giving, they eat without having given. Stinginess overcomes their minds. There's another list where he names the six objects of respect. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, training, heedfulness. And then he adds the sixth of hospitality, receiving guests. And this quality is sacred throughout history. I know a friend who lived in Japan and said that when he entered a Japanese household and he expressed admiration for a painting on the wall, there's about a 50% chance the host would immediately offer him the painting. What would it mean to hold hospitality at that level of sanctity? There's a Christian uh, monastery where one monk spent some time and it was their rule that if someone walked into the door of their workshop, if they didn't have a cup of tea in that person's hand in three minutes, then they had failed. So if you sort of find that you're, you don't have many opportunities for hospitality at the moment, you feel like you don't get people over a lot, change that. You know, we talk about having a Sabbath day of practice, but that doesn't necessarily just mean cutting off contact and pulling in. Maybe you do make space for meditation in the afternoon and evening, one day a week. But in the morning, can you invite people over for brunch? Can you go bring food to a neighbor who needs it? Can you make a point of every week having some place of giving and hospitality and cultivating this deeper relinquishment of the heart? The Buddha talks about the way that one gives a true person gives respectfully, gives with their own hands, gives carefully, gives what is valuable, gives with a view that something will come of it. So when you have a gift, if yes, you could just send it to someone via Amazon with those little receipts that say, you know, I thought of you. <laughs> Love me and Jeff Bezos. <laughs> or, or can you order it for your, you know, bring it, have it sent to you and then give it to them with your hands and that little extra effort of wrapping it, of putting it in a bag, of making sure you give it respectfully at the right time with your own hands, this increases the merit, um, the, the goodness associated. Can you learn to give beautifully? And can you sort of cultivate this thing where after a time, the first thing you think of when you get a new object is who can I give this to? Who can I give this to? It's a beautiful way to sublimate or su subvert craving. When you see that one item on Amazon that you want, can you click buy but change the address to a friend's? Or in line with what I just said, keep it as your own address and, <laughs> yeah, mixing metaphors. <laughs> um, 
the Buddha says that when, this, when the house is on fire, the vessel salvaged will be the one of use. So when this life, this world is on fire with birth, aging, and death, that which is given is well salvaged. Everything we don't give away, we lose in the end. It's ripped away from us. But the merit, the goodness of the heart, the quality of giving and spaciousness that we gain by giving away something lasts into the next life. And even if you don't believe in that much, you can feel how that recollection of having given away the piece of cake lasts much longer than the piece of cake. Can this become something of a mantra? What can you give every moment um, and there's a practice many of you know called the Saraniya practice in Sri Lanka where people determine not to eat until they've given. I know people have taken that on and it's really beautiful. So Donna. The next is Sila. Virtue, morality. And these aren't precepts given from on high, but rather training rules which we take on because they align with the human heart. It's a very quick discovery when you meditate that if you've compromised your sila, if you've done something that you know is beneath you, it sticks, there's a residue, and the mind will not become calm. The feedback is quick and immediate and refines little by little over the course of our practice. And to not overlook sila. Ajahn Chah rarely spoke about the jhanas by the numbers. He rarely spoke about the stages of awakening in as many words. What he stressed again and again was right view and morality, right view and sila. And just that much is the basis of a profoundly beautiful life that changes the heart far more than we give it credit for. Ajahn Karunadamo, um, just in a talk recently, he said that as he moved towards ordination, he constantly thought, if I can just manage to keep the precepts, to hold firmly to them. I think he was talking about the eight precepts at the time, but the same applies for the five. He said, I could die happy. And we do want to aim for more. We do want to aim to cleanse the heart completely. And full awakening is the end goal of the Buddhist path. But not to put aside what it means to hold clean sila in a world which is less than clean. And it takes real effort um, to hold good the, to the fourth precept in a work environment of not lying is very hard. It takes a determination when you enter that career that you will not lie and it will cost you at first. Um, there's a story of a practitioner we know who, um, when he took on his career, he determined, I, I will not lie, I will not compromise my, my truthfulness. And initially it lost him some clients, but over time people began to know this is someone who you can trust completely, and things panned out just fine. And this sense of pride and strength, wholesome pride. Uh, similarly, we had someone talk about just recently how they entered a new work environment and um, people just like to drink. And she said, you know, it's funny how difficult it is just not to drink in these social environments. Um, and yet, you know, how strange that it's that difficult, that it's so taken for granted that alcohol is just a given. And what does it mean to have a few people in the eye of the world who don't do that? Uh, alcohol does such damage over, you know, across society. Just to have a few people who order the virgin Appletini. You know, you don't have to make a big thing of it, but that level of sila really takes commitment, but there's this pride, a wholesome sense of self-worth, which gathers strength over time where you can look back at your last year or two years or three years and say, I'm someone who does not lie. I am someone who does not kill. And it soaks into the heart in a way you wouldn't think to the point where two or three years ago you might have slapped a mosquito and suddenly you find you can't, it, it, it seems so apart from what you would ever do that when you see someone do it, it, it hurts the heart. It's 
baffling almost. Like, why would you do that? So sila is a, a very beautiful thing, and it issues into what the Buddha called uh, anavacha sukha, uh, an unsullied happiness. There's this phrase in the suttas, one becomes sensitive to the pleasure of morality, of virtue, of being blameless. One becomes sensitive to the, vir to the pleasure of being blameless. That's one of those phrases which has echoed with me through years and has become more and more true. The next quality, renunciation, doesn't necessarily mean uh, a sort of, there's a sutta called the Magandhya Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 75, where this one wanderer comes up to the Buddha and calls him a destroyer of growth. Basically that all these teachings he's giving on renunciation are just kind of a, a buzzkill to put it into modern terms. And the Buddha says in response, Magandhya, I have seen the origination, the cessation, the danger, the attraction, and the escape in terms of sensual pleasures. Having seen these, I no longer burn with the fever for sensual pleasures. I see beings consumed, devoured by craving for sensual pleasures, burning with fever for sensual pleasures, and I do not envy them, nor do I delight therein. Why is that? Because, Magandhya, I know a pleasure surpassing divine bliss that is greater than sensual pleasures. So why would I envy or desire what is inferior? And then he draws the analogy of a leper. He says, just as a leper might cauterize their wounds and scabs over a pit of coals, picking the scabs and find some measure of satisfaction in picking those scabs. Even so, when one indulges in sensual pleasures, one finds some measure of satisfaction. But then imagine a doctor comes and gives that leper medicine. Would that leper envy his former self picking at those scabs over the fire. Even so, I do not envy those trapped by sensual fever. So a classic and memorable analogy. But when the Buddha says sensual pleasures, he's not saying we have to turn back from all that's beautiful in the world. There's another sutta where he says, the beautiful things of the world remain as they are, but the wise remain unshaken, unattached. What sensual pleasures are, in another sutta, the Buddha defines as someone's resolve on sensual pleasures. It's not necessarily the cake, it's thinking about the cake for two or three hours or a day beforehand. It's how we constantly absorb and chase and obsess and narrow our vision and compromise our hearts by focusing them on things we know will last just a brief moment. And the Buddha names three levels of happiness. He talks about uh, near samisasukha, which is pleasure based on the five chords of sensuality. This is the pleasurable sights, sounds, etc. Then there's niramisasukha, uh, sukha is happiness, and this means spiritual happiness. This is an internal bliss that comes from unification of mind, that comes from the pleasure of being blameless, that comes from loving kindness, that comes from the path. And not only is it more refined and more beautiful and a cleaner burning fuel, but it's also not fragile. Sami Sasuka, if the world does not bend to our will, we cannot satisfy it. So much of this path is nekama, putting aside, putting down those sensual crutches little by little and finding this other happiness rising to fill its absence. And the third level of happiness is that of nibbana, which is completely unshakable. Nekama can be held 
very wrong. Um, people sometimes go in and there's this sense of, I need to give up more, eat less, you know, eat little, speak little, sleep little, which can be good instruction. But if held wrong, there's a sense of violence, of cutting off, of cauterizing. And if you notice that, name it for what it is. It's, it's dukkha based on the craving to not become. And it can be let go of. But if there's the nekama, the sila of simplicity, of putting down what is unnecessary, not only is there a place in our practice for seeing that actually we've found a better happiness and we don't need to go see the new Marvel movie right away, but sometimes you also have to force things a little bit because if our heart is constantly soaked in the old, it never has room or space to feel or taste the new. The Buddha speaks about the heart drawn out of the stream of sensual pleasures, Mara's stream, like a fish drawn out of the river, and it flops around for a while. That's a really helpful and comforting analogy when you feel the heart flopping, is just think, okay, it's, this will stop over time. You just have to give it time. But some of these happinesses take a bit to manifest. And sometimes it's okay to put down something first before we've completely intuited what will replace it. But so much of this path is replacing the old fare which we used to feed the heart on with wholesome food for the heart. And this is the essence of nekama, renunciation. A prime directive of the heart is to interact and converse and commune with the world. But the default setting is to take and to feed off of the world. That's one meaning of upadana, attachment, craving, clinging, to feed, like fire on wood, turning it to ash, an agitated burn, tanha, thirst. So we replace those activities of craving, of feeding, with activities of chanda, which is a wholesome, enthusiastic zeal to make things whole, to practice Dhamma. So we replace these aspects of craving with giving, with, uh, you know, the listening to music, maybe you replace it with a Dharma podcast on the way to, to work. But very concretely, you can't expect to be able to renounce without having replaced that with something. Um, Yes, you can get rid of the Netflix, but you might find that you need to invite people over and feed them dinner twice a week to kind of feed the heart what it misses. But you'll find it's a much better food. So skillfully navigating renunciation is key. The next is Kanti, patient and No, no, it's not. It's wisdom. Um, and Panya. The Buddhist, well, the commentaries speak of three kinds of panya, wisdom. There's suttamaya panya, which is wisdom that comes from hearing the teachings or reading them. Then there's chintamaya panya, which is from contemplating those teachings. And then bhavanamaya panya, which is wisdom that only emerges from practice. And that's when the heart has clarified and calmed in samadhi. You find that truths seep in at a deep level and suddenly you realize that something you'd been turning away from or hadn't seen is clear. This is, you know, the body becomes stronger through movement. The mind becomes calm, stronger through stillness. So, yes, we do want to listen to the teachings. We do want to discuss them and think about them. That's suttamaya panya and chintamaya panya. Chinta means thinking. But bhavanamaya panya, that particular what you'd call warrior knowledge, that after the zip file has been downloaded, you unzip it, you apply it. And this is much of the practice. These are very simple teachings at their heart. The insight that issues into stream entry is everything that is of the nature to arise, is of the nature to cease. That's it. I uh, once told one of my relatives, you know, yeah, when you 
when the mind becomes calm, it sees truth. And she said, okay, what's, what's truth? With a slightly skeptical tone, like, okay, you're going to tell me what it is. And things are impermanent. I mean, who can really argue with that? But if you see that clearly, then the heart lets go. And what it lets go into is, is nibbana. So this sense of calming the mind, making sure you're meditating every day, and making sure you're applying the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha said the Four Noble Truths were like an elephant's footprint, where every other footprint of every other animal will fit inside that footprint. And similarly, the Four Noble Truths are always applicable, and they encompass all other truths. So coming back to that again and again, and in particular, the First Noble Truth, if you find you're pushing too hard, if you find you're in doubt about something in your life, can you apply the most basic metric of wisdom and see, here's dukkha. I'm clinging to something. What am I clinging to? And this applies on the path as we refine over and over again. The Four Noble Truths are a spiral staircase. We circle back around to the same sankaras, the same habits, the same sufferings, the same neuroses. But every time we do, you skim off some of the surface. You see a little more clearly. And in the end, you might find those same clockwork, that same gears of suffering turn in you, but there's this spaciousness around them. You can't expect, it's like one of those little um, kind of terrifying monkeys that like with the symbols that you wind up and it just sort of clashes at symbols. It'll keep doing its weird monkey thing. But there's, there's a a spaciousness around it. Ajahn Jayasaro says, you know, the dispassion of Buddhism isn't the monkey becoming tired of what it's been holding to. It's us becoming tired of being monkeys. I think that's quite good. So just applying that wisdom of the Four Noble Truths, whenever it comes up in practice particularly, if you're pushing yourself a little too hard, can you feel that sense of unwholesome violence? That's, that's dukkha. And can you let it go and release into a more serene way of navigating this path? When you find that you take on a new set of morality or uh, precepts or meditation and you find yourself looking down at those around you, can you notice the dukkha, the suffering involved in that action of conceit? And of course, we can't avoid that at first. But can you apply the Four Noble Truths again and again that spiral staircase, watch it gather, you know, watch yourself walk up it slowly. So we got through four of the ten. I think we'll call it good for now and continue later. Sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu Anumodami. There's another really good Longpur Cha story where uh, some of the local villagers, I think, were disgruntled with him for some reason, and they sent an assassin to actually try to kill him. And uh, this man came, and uh, Longpur Cha kind of fixed him with a, a stare. And I think it, it may have been he sort of kept coming to get a read of the landscape. And after a time, he just began to realize this monk was different than he'd thought. Like he was really special. And he confessed his, you know, what he'd been hired to do. And Longpur Cha said, I think some people might be a little upset by that. And uh, this monk ended up ordaining, uh, and, or this man ended up ordaining, and he was one of the most colorful characters at Wapapong. So it's good stories. <laughs> We have time for some questions or whatever people would like to talk about. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand and we can call on you. You can also type your question into the chat. If you're here in person, just raise your hand and we'll run a mic over to you. It can be to do with the talk or not. Cliff. Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, Zoomers. Okay. You've been talking about the thing that's on my mind. You've been calling it navigating. I would call it negotiating. And let's take the example of you're at a, a party, someone offers you some Chablis, 
right? You've got three things What's in conflict. What's Chablis? Chablis is a kind of wine. Gotcha. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got the sila about alcohol. You've also got the sila about lying or harmful speech. And you also got a paramita of hospitality. Uh, someone offers you the wine. Um, you've got three things in conflict. How do you negotiate those? Well done, Cliff. That is a really good question. Sorry. Um, so, some traditions expand the five precepts like Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, does. So, for example, in Thich Nhat Hanh, the fifth precept on intoxicants is expanded to include entertainment. Um, and there's a beauty to that expansion, like especially horror movies, apparently, that's really off the table for the, that, that lineage. Um, and I think it's very much worth expanding the ethic behind the precepts as wide as we possibly can. There's a teacher of Longpur Cha's named Longpur Tongrat, and one of his practices given to him by Ajahn Mun was to keep the five precepts absolutely perfectly in body, speech, and mind. And that, you know, they say that that brought him at least, you know, most of the way to awakening, if not all the way. Um, the downside with that is that the wider we expand the precepts, the more we do need to fudge the edges a little bit. Like if you are determining not to watch entertainment, but then you're at home with your parents, they're not super Buddhist, they don't want to meditate with you, but they just want to have a, watch a movie with their kid. Um, probably the right thing to do in that case is to hold hospitality paramount and just watch a movie with your parents. Um, by the way, people can watch Netflix, it's okay, you know, it's not the end of the world. I'm just... So the benefit of holding the five as just what the Buddha established them at is that you really can hold them pretty much perfectly. And because they're so constrained at their core, that's your grounding is, yes, there's these three things in conflict, hospitality, um, not lying, and not taking intoxicants. Um, but two of those are precepts. And so they take precedence. And um, so, yeah, if you just say, oh, thank you so much, I actually don't drink, you know? Um, and it's significant. Like, maybe you can just have one glass of wine, but maybe your kid can't. Maybe someone else at that party can't. And if people are confronted with a world where everyone drinks, every single adult drinks, that's what adults do, you drink, then that's, that's kind of a that's less of a world that I want to live in. It's okay to have a few people who are just, you know, if your host is that offended by you just asking for a seltzer instead, like, that's their problem, you know? And, like, if you remember when you are a kid, like, I remember when my dad would have a, a glass of beer. Um, he, he keeps the five precepts now, but I noticed, like, you feel the difference as a kid when your parent has even one glass. Like, something changes in them. Um, so, you know, the five precepts and, and that thing about truth you know, we don't agree with white lies in Buddhism, and it takes skill. Like, these precepts are a learned skill, because you have to, like, become quite good at how do you speak, how do you not speak a lie, but not say what's unskillful? And sometimes that means changing the subject. Sometimes it means being vague in certain aspects. Sometimes it means really preparing for what you're going to say if someone someone asks you something. Um, you know, but uh, I think usually... But it's so valuable to have an ethic where you know your loved one knows they can say, did you, did you cheat on me? And you say no, and that, that's it. That's done. They know you will not lie to them. So I'd say, yeah, in, in a case like that, there are these conflicting values, but the precepts are the ground. The Buddha said that's the root of our humanity. And then as you expand from there in terms of hospitality and stuff, then it becomes an interesting navigation which uses wisdom. So I think that is a good point is like, there are places where we can, you know, really hold that value as, as important and paramount, but the five precepts remain. Does that help at all, Cliff? Okay.
don't know how guilty people are going to feel if they're going to parties tonight. So <laughs> a little guilty is okay. <laughs> Please, Zoom person. I think you're muted. Like to thank Ajahn. Oh, we can hear you now. Go for it. Uh, thank you, Ajahn. First of all, I would like to thank you for inspiring many people to walk into the Dhamma. Like uh, I was uh, uh, following you from past few weeks. I see many of them joining and inspiring through your talks. I wish all of them happiness. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you. Yes, no, I, I think uh, we've been given these teachings. They're just profound. I, they begin to sink in deeper and deeper. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you sort of come across the suttas at first and you think they sound pretty wise in certain respects, but the more you hear of what the Buddha left us, the more I just, he's an unparalleled spiritual genius, and we're so, it's such a gift that we have these teachings, so. Yes, Ajahn. Ajahn, uh, your teachings basically relate with uh, Ajahn Chah's tradition, and you relate with uh, the speakers like uh, Dhamma, Dhamma followers, which inspires many people. And uh, I was followed you because of uh, the interview you have taken with uh, Tenzin Palmo in uh, India. We got in touch with you because of that interview and then we have been following with you. Great. Thanking you, Ajahn. Okay, Sahadu, Sahadu. Yeah, that was a really great interview, Tenzin Palmo. <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, If some of you haven't seen that interview, it's on the YouTube channel. It's called Solitary Refinement, and it's with Tenzin Palma, who spent 10 or 12 years meditating in a cave. Um, and it, it is, she's one of the most amazing beings in existence today, I think. If you haven't read her biography, Cave in the Snow, you really, really should. It's, it's astounding. So thank you for bringing that up. Sid. Yeah, I wanted to say three things. So th first of all, thank you, Ajahn, for the great talk. And second thing is, good to see Mary there. She's looking good, and uh, good to see my mom. Hi. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I just wanted to remind everybody that, uh, yeah, the agent said about uh, donation and um, I think we're OK. Yeah, cultivating virtues and all this. It might seem a little bit difficult initially, but uh, also I wanted to remind everybody that uh, the way I see our path is, is very gradual. So some some person cannot... So when I started practicing, I would see some people are pra meditating for hours, and then I would think, like, oh my God, how do you do that? But then you do not aim directly for like one hour or two hours of meditation. You try with like 30 seconds. And then once you are comfortable with 30 seconds, you just go a little bit, little bit more. You do not target for immediately going for two hours of meditation the first day, but take weeks or months, and eventually you'll be very surprised. Like um, the other day, someone was asking me, like, "Oh, you meditate like pretty long time?" And when Ajahn is talking, I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, when I started, I would see other people doing that, and I'd be very, very surprised." But yeah, I just wanted to say yeah, it's it's really difficult for us to give, for example, money because we all cling. So I would say like don't shoot for like maybe twenty dollars or uh, hundred dollars. Maybe shoot for like fifty cents. Maybe shoot for one dollars, and then go from there. Once you see like okay, I can give one dollars, and then it feels good, and then you can try one dollar and twenty five cents, and you can go from there. Like I wanted to r remind everybody that the Buddha didn't get in enlightened immediately. It took like millions and millions of his birth uh, to, to become perfect in his virtues and everything. So yeah, good luck everybody. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I think what Sid is saying is important in, a asp in one quality, which is I think many of us are actually quite okay giving money. 
I, I don't have money. If you all, you know, like that's fairly common. Time, time is what we're stingy with. And where you find you're attaching the most, that's where you need to give. And there's a kind of magical quality with those particular pressure points where when you actually open it up, you find it's these things that create time. They, they feel like they make your week more spacious because by giving, you're affirming that you're wealthy enough to give. So by giving time, by hosting a brunch, a dinner, by going over to your friend or your neighbor who's old with a plate of cookies, you know, and spending an hour talking to them, you're affirming at this profoundly deep level, I have enough time to do this. I'm not actually as constrained as I thought. And so I'd say, yes, you know, generosity in any form is important, but giving your time is something I think we're particularly bad at, and it's exactly where we need to be most attentive to, maybe. So, yeah, thank you, Sid. I think we have time for one more in-person question, perhaps. Suze. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, practicing with the Parmis is such a powerful part of our practice, and I just wanted to invite everybody. Seattle Insight is spending the entire year on the Parmis, and we're having quite the wonderful time with it. Um, so this month um, of April, we're on renunciation, and um, just for additional practice opportunities, Monday nights, Sunday mornings, Thursday nights. Um, it's really being um, so rich in my own life, um, taking on the um, parami of renunciation this month. And I've been working with um, the role of worry in my life. And what a, what a deep and fabulous investigation. So just wanted to invite others um, to join us. Thank you, Susan. And once again, that's uh, sa Sunday mornings at Sunday what time? mornings from 10 to 11.30. Monday? Monday nights, both in person and um, online from 7 to 9. And Thursday nights, I think it's 6.30. 6.30 to 8.30. Nice. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so lots of opportunities. I'd be happy to talk with anybody after. Yeah, People but, have questions. Yeah, Suze and Steve, can you both raise your hands? Well, Suze is the mic, so you know who she is. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Suze and Steve, and there's often some others as well, really are Dharma kind of foundations in the Seattle Insight community. And uh, much of the community we have is really founded on that substrate and it's a beautiful partnership and friendship so do look up the seattle insight website seattleinsight.org uh, not don't google sims that just comes up with the video game i've done it before <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's good okay i do think we have to wrap up <laughs>